Hello, hello everyone. Today we are going to talk about goodness of fit. That is how to check that the way we try to summarize our data here with the regression is the right one. More than ever, it is about using stats properly so that we can trust what it tells us. For those of you who know me, it is once more about what comes before producing a p-value, which should never be the end game. It's about quantifying the trust we have in the model we are building. And I present here goodness of fit in the context of regression, but really the reasoning is the same for other statistical tests. In a nutshell, goodness of fit is about how well the model we chose for our data fits. Like here, for instance, we want to know if there is a relationship between X and Y. So we add lines of best fit, for instance, and then we wonder or should be wondering if it is the right summary. Or if we should worry about values like this one, for instance. And more generally, what about assumptions associated with the regression? So basically, we want to know how good is our model, how well does it fit our data. Okay, so the cool thing is that there are many clues we can use to help us check the goodness of fit of our model. I am going to talk about five, but there are more. And I have chosen these five because I think they are the best ones, but also because they are super easy to find with Prism. The first clue is pretty universal. It is the graphical exploration of the data. It does not matter what we are looking at, what type of data, how complex or simple the experimental design is, we always, always start with the visual exploration of the data. If we do it properly, we can get pretty much all our answers from there. So that's clue number one. Clue number two, identification of outliers. We need to know if some values are misbehaving. Clue number three, the coefficient of determination, R square, one of my favorite things. So informative, I love it. The last two clues are about checking the distribution of the data. And we can do that by looking at the residuals in two different ways, with statistical test or with a QQ plot, which is another of my favorite things. Okay, let's look into these clues a little bit more in detail. First thing, always the graphical representation. We look at our data and the cool thing with regression is that we can pretty much summarize and explore at the same time because we usually represent on the same graph all the values together with the model. Here, we want essentially to get to know the data and see if, at first glance, a linear relationship between X and Y seems okay, which is what we see here. Second clue, the outliers. Now, an outlier always means the same thing. It is a value which does not belong, which is too far. Too far from a mean, for instance, though a box plot really shows the median actually, or too far from a line of best fit. The point is, an outlier is too far from a chosen way to summarize the data, to quantify a pattern. Next, R square, the coefficient of determination. Totally cool. If you're not familiar with it, let me introduce you to R square. It gives the proportion of variance in Y that can be explained by X, often in percentage. Okay, not so impressive so far. It's best if I show you. Say we have this data here and we think, okay, there is a pattern, a negative relationship between the two variables, a negative relationship which seems strong and steady. One way to check it out is to draw a line of best fit. And speaking of fit, it's a really good one, right? Now, how good exactly? Well, that's what the R square tells us. And here it is 76%. So a little more than three quarters of the variability of variable two is explained by, by variable one, which is quite a lot and makes sense when we look at the graph. Now, what about this data? We still have an idea of a negative relationship between the two variables, but not as strong. And that's confirmed with R square which this time is only 46%. And again, it makes sense, as we can see that there is more to variable two than its relationship to variable one. I explain how R square is calculated, by the way, in the video on regression with two predictors. For the last two clues, we have to look at residuals. Let's see what they are first. Like often in stats, a parameter says what it is. The residuals are what is left when we have summarized the data. So for instance here, the residuals are the differences, positive and negative, between the actual values and the line of best fit, which is supposed to summarize their behavior. 
And now we need to think about the classic assumption of normality. For us to trust that this line is a good fit, we expect to see the values harmoniously, or at least symmetrically, distributed on either side of it. And we would expect the distribution of these residuals to be normal. So first, we can check for normality using statistical tests. They can tell us if there is or not a significant departure from normality. So there is the anderson darling test, which compares the cumulative distribution of our data, here the residuals, with a normal one, or there is the D'Agostino-Pearson test, which compares asymmetry and shape between the distribution of the residuals and a normal distribution. There are other tests, like the Shapiro-Wilk or the Kolmogorov-Smirnov test, for instance, but they are more complex to understand or obsolete, and in any case, not more informative. Have you noticed that statisticians always seem to work in pairs, by the way? One last thing. These tests, like all statistical tests, are associated with power. Their p-value should always be interpreted with that in mind. If you're a bit shaky about power, I did a video on it. The other way to check out the distribution of the residuals is by using a QQ plot, which is one of my favorite things, as it is a very elegant and intuitive way to do it. If you're not familiar with QQ plots, here is how it works. On the x-axis are the actual values. On the y-axis, we have the predicted values, which have the same mean, the same standard deviation, that's the noise, the viability of the data, the same sample size, but are coming from a perfectly normal distribution. If the residuals are normally distributed, we would expect the values to fall into a line, like in an almost perfect correlation, which is what we kind of see here. By the way, QQ stands for quantile quantile, and a quantile is about quantity, so it is the quantity or proportion of values that we expect to see at a certain place in the distribution or at a certain distance of the line of best fit. Pretty cool, right? Right, let's do it now. We are going to look at the relationship between time spent revising and exam anxiety in boys and girls, and why not? But what we are really going to focus on is getting the model, the fit right, rather than on the relationship between the variables. Okay, like always, PRISM tries to make our life easy. The first clue we get by choosing a straight line for our model. Moving on to the method to do it, PRISM offers to report outliers. Bingo, that's clue number two. Then if we must, we can think about the actual relationship between time spent revising and exam anxiety and the difference between boys and girls, which we can get by comparing the slopes. Finally, if we choose diagnostics, we have the last three clues, R-square and normality of the residuals with stats or QQ plot. Now, let's have a look at the results. Plotting the data, a linear relationship seems to work here. However, there are a few values which are a bit worrying, such as this boy on the bottom left. Okay, so as suspected, he is an official outlier, along with two others. Values with ID 87 and 78 were pretty obvious actually, 24 perhaps a little less so. Before we decide what to do about them, let's check the other clues to get a full picture. So let's move to clue number three. Like many parameters, R-square is best interpreted in context. Now here, the most surprising thing is that the one for the girls is almost two times bigger than the one for the boys. I find it surprising because when I look at the graph, I do not get the feeling that the relationship between X and Y is much weaker or messier for one gender than the other. There is perhaps a difference between boys and girls, but it does not appear to be that big. So there is something going on here. Let's move on to the next clue where we check the distribution of the residuals with statistical test. Anderson, Darling, D'Agostino and Pearson do not like the residuals one bit. So the more we go through the clues, the more we get a feeling that our model is not a good fit for this data. And now the last clue, perhaps my favorite, the QQ plot. Here we can see two things. First, overall, the values are kind of okay, as in the residuals are behaving more or less normally. The girls being a bit better at it than the boys, maybe. We can identify two outliers easily. And I say two because when we look at the actual data, the third one, value 24, does not seem to misbehave all that much. It is away from the rest, but still following the right pattern, shall we say. We can see it on the graph with the real data, but it is more obvious on the QQ plot. 
So here is what I think. We should get rid of 78 and 87, but keep 24, run our model again and see what we get. And here it is. If we remove one girl, we increase the R square by about 10%. And if we remove one boy, we increase the R square by about 30%. So that one boy alone was taking away almost a third of the fit of our model. And now we can see that the normality guys do like the residuals. Okay, they are not thrilled about them, but our data passed the test. And now we can conclude with reasonable confidence that there is a strong negative relationship between time spent revising and exam anxiety, and that relationship is significantly stronger for boys than for girls. By using a set of clues and our common sense, we did build a model that, when we look at it, makes sense and fit nicely the data. Thank you for listening, and don't forget, stats don't have to be scary. <laughs>